So the argument today is this in regards to the food. Well, don't you know, all food is clean. Okay. <laughs> Let's address it. All right. All food is clean. I agree. Let me explain. <laughs> Let me explain. Where do we go to find out what food is? <laughs> it's in the Torah. Where is food defined? What is food and that which is not to be eaten? That which is to be eaten, that which is not to be eaten. Where do we find that? In the Torah. In other words, if it's not food, don't call it food. Once you learn what food is, then you also know what food is not. A cow is food. The fence that keeps the cows from roaming all over the place is not. <laughs> but you get the point. Where is it defined? Okay. If it is not to be eaten, it is not food. Now notice the word is food, not flesh. It's food. Traditional Christianity, I'm talking about Constantine, okay? Traditional Christianity, taken back there and even before that, rejected the dietary commands shortly after parting from Judaism. It was trying to separate from anything Jewish. Even to the decree, if we, if we find you observing Sabbath, we will kill you. Boy, that's been a story for the ages, isn't it? So this, if the Talmudim of Yeshua himself didn't care about keeping kosher, Why'd they say something about it? If those who walked with him and were his disciples and studied with him, if they, if they didn't care, why did they address it? Hmm. How about Peter? Peter said specifically he had never eaten anything considered unclean. What's the word? Never. I wonder how many meals he ate with Yeshua. And he never had eaten anything. Him. Oh no, but Peter's sheep. Right, Stu? Nope, Peter's sheep. It came down and these animals and... All right. Remember the thing I said about context? If you keep reading, Peter himself defines that. <laughs> All right, I'll show you really quick. So the sheet lowers and Peter is told to kill and eat. And Peter argues with God. He says he has never eaten anything unclean or trife. And he is told, what God has made clean, do not call, what's that word? Common. He didn't say unclean. He said common. Okay? I'm going to cover this a little more and I'll give you the definitions of these words. But common has to do more with idolatry than it does with unclean food. Or that's, a, that's an oxymoron, unclean animals. Verse 17. So Peter was still puzzling over the meaning of this vision. Yeah, he was. Because, you know, here he is, and he's, he's getting hungry. You know, they're cooking downstairs, and he kind of goes off in this vision, and he sees this sheep, and, uh, and it's all these things that he would not eat. And some people say, well, why would God use food to talk to him about food and to say don't eat it? Because it's not food. The issue he was addressing is not the food, not that he was hungry. God was using a state that he was in to proclaim something deeper. The issue was the people, not the animals. I mean, even this. The Gentiles in Yeshua's day were considered dogs. Unclean animals. Right? And so... Here, Peter, he's, he's looking at this and he sees this sheet and it's lowered down. And he's perplexed. What in the world does this mean? Arise, kill, and eat. I have never eaten anything like that. Why would he say this? What's going on? So while Peter's mind was still on the vision, the Spirit said, hey, three men are looking for you. They're downstairs. Go down and meet them. Oh, and by the way, don't have any qualms about going with them because I sent them to you. Why would Peter's 
be standoffish about going with these men. They were Gentiles. They were not Jewish. So why would he go with these men who were not Jews? Because uh, you're not Jewish. That was the issue. Not, not anything to do with food. Has God ever talked to you about something where you're at? He kind of met you where you're at and used that as an example. Peter was hungry. So God used that as an example to say, look, I have cleansed these people. Don't call them idolaters. Don't call them unclean or common. Keep reading. Acts 10, 28. So he said to them, you are well aware that for a man who is a Jew to have close association with someone who belongs to another people or to come and visit with them is something that just isn't done. See, Peter's defining the vision. Okay? And then he says, but God has shown me I can eat whatever I want. It doesn't fit, does it? Then that's not the meaning of the vision. It says, but God has shown me not to call any person common or unclean. Acts 10.34 so then Peter addressed it. He says, I now understand that God does not play favorites, but that whoever fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him no matter what people he belongs to. That was the issue in Acts 10. A Jew did not eat with a Gentile. Why? Because even if you were eating, let's say I'm making lamb, but I was unclean, and I make the lamb, even though the animal itself is clean, if something unclean touches something clean, what happens to it? It becomes unclean. So a Jew would not eat with a Gentile because even if that's the case, I could have made the lamb unclean. Or even if it was clean, maybe I offered it up to an idol because I'm not a Jew, I'm a Gentile. That was the issue. That was exactly what was going on. This was not a matter of hey, I want you to come to my house and I want to serve you dinner. Oh, okay, are we having chicken or pork? That was not the case. The case was, you know, eating with a Gentile, not, the, not that which was served, okay? So this is the issue that was addressed in uh, Yeshua in Mark 7, 1 through 9. Eating with ritually unwashed hands was the issue. Okay, eating with ritually unwashed hands. So that this is what they were talking about. Uh, if a man had touched something that was unclean, everything he touched became unclean. Even, so if he touched that which was food, and he was unclean, now it would be called what? Unclean. So they had the ritual, they would wash their hands, and it's not just washing their hands to get the dirt off, there was a ritual to washing the hands, right? They would wash the hands, and they would have to do this and this, and then move on. And, and uh, so, so that wasn't the point. I mean, let's face it, guys. Is it a good idea to wash your hands before you eat? Definitely, okay? But that wasn't what they were talking about. They were talking about the ritual that went along with it, okay? And that was what Yeshua was addressing. Look at this, Mark 7, 14. So Yeshua called to the people to him again, and he said, listen to me, all of you, and understand this. There is nothing outside a person which by going into him can make him unclean. Rather, it is the things that come out of a person which make him unclean. Anyone who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the people uh, and entered his house, his Talmudim began to ask him about the parable. And he replied, so you too are without understanding? Don't you see that nothing going into a person from outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and it passes out into the latrine. Thus, he declared all foods clean. Not a very good translation. I'll define that. Verse 20, it's what comes out of a person, he went on, that makes him unclean. Okay, note on verse 19. Because it enters not into his heart, but into the belly, and goes out into the draught or into the latrine, it is purging all meats. The word for meats is not flesh, it is the word for food. Okay, purging all food. What does purge mean? To get rid of it. <laughs> okay, let's just face the facts without getting graphic. You eat food, it goes into your belly, you get rid of it. That's what Yeshua was saying. Okay, that's the point of it, okay? So when you use the word for meat, so it says the food. So what is the Greek word there for food? 
It is the Greek word broma. What is the definition of the Greek word here for food? Are you ready? That which is allowed by Jewish law. You think that our bias as we approach the scripture kind of causes us to change things? Because even in scripture, the definition of the word food tells you to go back to the Torah to find out the definition of food. Mark 7, 21. For from within, out of a person's heart, comes forth wicked thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, and idolatry. Greed, malice, deceit, indecency, envy, slander, arrogance, foolishness. All these wicked things come from within, and they make a person unclean. Paul, Paul addressed this, because we've heard, you know, oh yeah, Paul takes this out, right? Look at this. Galatians 2, 11 through 14, I'm going to talk about verse 11 and 12. Furthermore, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him publicly because he was clearly in the wrong. Why was Peter in the wrong? For prior to the arrival of certain people from the community headed by Jacob, he had been eating with the Gentile believers, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he was afraid of the faction who favored circumcising Gentile believers. This does not mean that Peter was sitting over in the corner eating ham sandwiches with the Gentiles, and then when Jacob's crew come to town, he like, oh, no, I can't be doing that. I'm, let's go have some falafels. That is not what it is talking about. Remember the issue we were talking about. The issue is not what they were eating. The issue is the people. Are they idolaters or are they believers? Because to be eating with the Gentiles means you're partaking in idolatry. That's what was being addressed. So Peter was eating with the Gentiles, and then when he thought that it could be perceived that, oh, I shouldn't be, you know, he doesn't want to be, accused of being in cahoots with idolatry or anything like that. So I know you guys are believers and what you're eating is cool, but I'm going to go over here. I'll see you all later. Has Peter ever shown this kind of behavior before? How about when he denied Yeshua three times? <laughs> okay? This is what was going on. How about this? The issue is eating with Gentiles makes you unclean. That's what was going on. Gentiles were considered what? Unclean. Idolaters were considered common. Okay? The issue was not whether if you're eating something that is kosher or not. The issue is, is it been idolatrous or not? Because if you would go to the market and you had a Jewish butcher here and a Gentile butcher here, they both are serving lamb. They both have lamb. I can go over here and I can buy from this guy or I can buy it from this guy about five shekels cheaper. I don't have a lot of money, so I'm going to go buy it from this guy. The issue is, okay, so he's a Gentile. Did he by chance, upon the slaughter of this animal, dedicate it to one of his deities? Involve this animal in ritual slaughter to his gods. Did he involve this animal in idolatry? This is why you see through the scripture where it says, uh, and I'll, we'll, I'll show you the scripture where it talks about, oh, but some believers only ate vegetables because of the eating. And, and no, don't let what you eat be, be a stumbling block. Eat, if someone eats vegetables, that they don't want to eat meat. You know, It's got nothing to do with kosher or not. What it has to do with is idolatry. Remember Acts 15 where it says even abstain from idolatry? Right? That's what was going on. Romans 14, so here we go. Now as for a person whose trust is weak, welcome him, but not to get into arguments over opinions. One person has the trust that will allow him to what? Eat anything. While another whose trust is weak does what? Eats only vegetables. This has nothing to do with is what they're getting kosher or not. What this has to do with is, is it common or not? Has it been offered to idols or not? And if it's been offered to idols, why do you want to partake of it? Right? This is the issue that's it's going on here. So look at this, Daniel 1.8. Daniel received or resolved that he would not defile himself with what? The king's food or wine he drank. So he asked the chief officer to be excused from defiling himself. Daniel 1.12. 
So please try and experiment on your servants for 10 days. Have them give us only vegetables to eat and water to drink. Daniel 1.16. So the guard took away their food and the wine they were supposed to drink and gave them vegetables. When people say, oh, we're going to do the Daniel fast, you know the reason why Daniel was doing a Daniel fast? Because the meat that was given from a king, it's not like he was saying he was being offered pork. He could have been offered lamb. But it was involved with idolatry because the king's butchers, as they would slaughter, would profess their deity. It was a ritual slaughter. So their food was offered to idols. And if you ate of that partaking in idolatry, now you are partaking in idolatry. Do you ever notice when we're talking about the food and everything else that it includes the wine too? Where does Scripture have to say anything about wine being kosher or not? Because the issue was not kosher or not. Because as they would have the wines, they would take the first of the wine, the first of the vat, and pour that out as a libation offering to their deity, to their idol, thereby dedicating the rest of the wine to that deity. Much like uh, where Scripture says, if the first fruit is holy, then the whole lump is holy. If the first is offered to God and is received as holy, then the entire crop is holy and is received and is given and is good. It's the same principle, but the other way. If it's, if it's dedicated to an idol, then the whole thing is dedicated to an idol. That's why Daniel wouldn't even drink the king's wine. It's not like, ooh, is this kosher wine? Before they made the wine, they dipped the pig in it. No, I don't think so. It was being offered to idols, right? This is exactly the same thing that was being uh, in the marketplace in the first century. It's the exact same scenario. When you have Gentiles coming to faith who are not involved in idolatry anymore, and they want you to come eat at their house, and they're serving you this lamb and you're questioning what butcher they brought it from. This is why it says all food is good and is to be off, to received with thanksgiving. Just, you know, pray over it. It wasn't about is it kosher or not. It was about has this been offered to an idol or not? I don't know. So we're going to pray and now I'm going to eat it. But if you know it's been offered to an idol, don't eat it. That was the issue. Okay, look at this. Exodus 34, 12. Be careful not to make a covenant with the people living in the land where you are going so that, so that they won't become a snare within your own borders. Rather, you are to demolish their altars, smash their standing stones, cut down their sacred poles, because you are not to bow down to any other god, since Adonai, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Look at verse 15. Do not make a covenant with the people living in the land. It will cause you to go astray after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, then they will invite you to join them in eating their sacrifices. So what's the big deal? Eating, I mean, meat's meat. What's the big deal? Okay, remember when we've been talking about the offerings that are given recently? When you go and you put the food on the altar, God said he's, that, that's his table. Remember I showed you the scripture? God said that's his table. So like the peace offerings, when you get portions of that back to eat, you're literally eating from the table of God. What happens if it's idols? You're eating from the table of idols. Does Yeshua care what we eat? Does it matter? I mean, after all, you know, that was you know, Torah stuff. What about you know, now? Okay. How about if I show you something from Revelation? Can we all agree? You know, if, if, if it was true then, and if it's true yet to be, by default, it's true now. <laughs> right? So let me show you something out of Revelation. Revelation 2, 12. To the angel of community in Pergamum, right? Pergamum, right? Here is the message from the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you are living. There, where the adversary's throne is, yet you are holding on to my name. You did not deny trusting me, even at the time when my faithful witness, Anipus, was put to death in your town, and where the adversary lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have some people who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to set a trap for the people of Israel, so that they would what? Eat food, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual sin. 
food sacrificed to idols. Hmm. What else? Revelation 2, 18 to 20. To the angel of the community of Thyatira, right here is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like burnished brass. I know what you're doing, your love, trust, service, and perseverance, and I know that you were doing more now than before, but I have this against you. You continue to tolerate the Jezebel woman, the one who claims to be a prophet. Drum roll, please. But is teaching and deceiving my servants to commit sexual sin. And what? It's a big and because it doesn't stop there. And what? Eat food that has been sacrificed to idols. Hmm. 1 Corinthians 10, 18-21 says this. Look at physical Israel. Don't those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? We just learned that, right? 19. So what am I saying? Food sacrificed to idols has any significance in itself? Or that an idol has significance in itself? No. What I am saying is that the things which the pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice not to God, but to demons. And I don't want you to become sharers of demons. Verse 21, you can't drink both a cup of the Lord and a cup of demons, and you can't partake in the meal of the Lord and a meal of demons. Amen. Amen. Romans 14, 14, I know, that is, I have been persuaded by the Lord Yeshua, that Messiah, that nothing is unclean in itself, but if a person considers something unclean, then for him it is unclean. I mean, you've heard this one. Nothing is unclean. So if you think it's unclean, that's fine for you, but I don't think it's unclean, so I'm going to eat whatever I want. Guess what? It's not what it says. The word for unclean, the word that is translated as unclean, is the Greek word koinos, which means common. Which means idolatry. In other words, offered to idols. As nothing, it does not mean pork. It means food that was offered to idols. Therefore, is common. Therefore, unclean. Follow me? That's, what's give, that's the word that's given here. The word that is for unclean the, the Greek word that is given that translates as unclean is akathartos. That's not the word that's used here. The Greek word that's used here is koinos, which means common. Akathartos means unclean. So, look at it this way. For I have been persuaded by the Lord Yeshua the Messiah that nothing is common or idolatrous. No food is common or idolatrous in itself. But if a person considers something idolatrous, then for him it is idolatrous. It changes the meaning, doesn't it? Romans 14, 20. Don't tear down God's work for the sake of food. True enough, all things are clean. But it is wrong for anyone by his eating to cause someone to fall away. What is good is not to eat meat or drink wine. Again, that's the issue with the drinking wine. Why about drinking wine? Because was it offered to an idol? Was the first of its vat poured out to a, de to a demon? Or do anything that causes your brother to stumble? Remember the issue, common, being dedicated to idols. That's what we're talking about. It's not an issue of you know, clean, unclean. It's issue of holy or common. 1 Peter 1, 15, 16. On the contrary, following the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in your entire way of life. Since the Tanakh says, you are to be holy because I am holy. Leviticus eleven forty five 45 says this, for I am the Lord that brings you up out of the land of Egypt. Why? To be your God. You shall therefore be what? Holy. Why? Because I am holy. 
It comes down to this. Remember Yeshua said in Luke chapter 6, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I say? And if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, at what point does he change? He doesn't. I think we need to listen. I think we need to have that understanding that he's given us. Well, if this teaching has blessed you, I want you to check out our other resources. You can check out our website at www.ruachonline.com. And there's links there to other resources that are available to you, other teachings, other books, other offerings. Uh, you can go to YouTube, Facebook, all of these things from our website. And uh, check us out, because if they enjoyed this teaching, there's going to be much more that hopefully will bless you as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. David Jones from Ruach Ministries International, and I've got some exciting news for you. We have a new series coming out, six-part series of the Gospel according to Abraham. Abraham? What does he got to do with the Gospel? Well, you're going to have to find out, aren't you? The thing is, Galatians 3 says that the Gospel was proclaimed to Abraham. So what does that mean for a believer today? What does that mean to a person who is not Jewish? What does that mean to a person who is Jewish? What does that mean for all of us today? Well, check it out. It's a good series and it'll be coming your way soon. For more information, you can check out our website at www.ruachonline.com. Hi, this is Dr. David Jones here. I just want to say we do have some other resources available to you, one of which is a book entitled Famine, Walking and Blessing in the Time of Famine. It's based out of Amos 8, 11, and 12, talking about there's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. So what is that famine? Does it mean the word of the Lord is not being proclaimed, or does it mean there's a famine of actually listening to it? Hmm. Food for thought, isn't it? Well, if you want to know more, check it out. Go to www.ruachonline.com. There's a link on our homepage. Just click and it'll take you for more information on the book entitled Famine, Walking in Blessing in a Time of Famine. Well, how important are the feasts of the Lord? I think we can say that if the Lord set out a banquet, set out a table and invited you to come be a partaker, would we answer? Would we hear? Would we go? Or would we blow them off because we have something more important to do? Well, that's what this book is. The king invites you to his table. Are we going to answer the call? The feast of the Lord, appointed times where the Lord has said he wants to meet with us face to face. Will we heed? Will we answer? Will we go? Check it out, www.ruachonline.com. On the homepage, there is a link to take you for more information. The King invites you to his table.